Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship. I'm your host, Melinda Brianna Epler, the founder and CEO of Change Catalyst, where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, and events. This series, the series goes deep and gets real. We build empathy for underrepresented and historically marginalized people, and we provide tangible, actionable steps that we can all take to be better allies and advocates for each other. We're extremely lucky to have Anthony, an ASL interpreter today. You'll see him on screen, and the ASL interpreter is sponsored by Interpreter Now. Today, we're discussing amplifying the Latinx experience in the workplace. Please welcome an incredible human. She's also been a friend and a colleague and a client over the years, uh, Daisy Oje Dominguez, uh, founder and CEO of Oje Dominguez Ventures. Welcome, Daisy. Thank you so much, Melinda. I'm thrilled to be here. And hello to everyone and all, the, all, all of the friends that I see on the chat. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Awesome. So, well, let's start with your story. Can you tell us a little bit about what your story is, how you got to be doing what you're doing now? What is that? Sure. Oh, you know, those, those, those really short stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I always begin with the beginning. Um, I was born in New York City to teenage parents of Dominican and Puerto Rican descent. Um, and I was raised in the Dominican Republic uh, from the age of two by my father's parents, my grandparents. Um, and there I not only navigated having a very different family relationship and environment, I was, I was technically the youngest of their kids, if you will, um, but still very much growing up with grandparents as parent figures, um, and then still a very close relationship with my father who still lived uh, in the US. Um, and, uh, and when I was growing up, I studied at an international school. That is how I learned English. And the intent and the purpose always uh, had been that I would come to America. And, and by the way, for any Dominicans out there, America for us is New York City. <laughs> um, and that I would come to the US uh, to study uh, at university. Uh, and my junior year of high school, my father um, learned of the PSATs and you know these tests that we're supposed to take to prepare you for college, and he decided to you know buy a house that he could ill afford in New Milford, New Jersey. That's in Bergen County, New Jersey. For any Jersey folks out there, um, and knowing that me moving to New York City would be very much of a shock for me, um, and and I think he was right. And so he, we moved into this small town, and I finished my last two years of high school there. And I often talk about that time in my life as. Um, the real awakening for me, I was, you know, I had grown up with a very strong national identity. I was Dominican and Puerto Rican. I grew up in this international school where my friends were from all over the world. And so for us, it was very normal to talk about our national heritage and our cultural backgrounds and how that influenced how we ate, how we danced, how we engaged. Um, but then all of a sudden I moved to the US and I became Hispanic. <laughs> and that was a term that all of a sudden seemed to envelop everything about me. And, and it wasn't a term that I rejected, but what, what felt uncomfortable to me was that it felt like a term that was putting me in a box. And it was a box that wasn't always very nicely defined, right? Um, when people spoke of Hispanics, it wasn't always in the most positive ways. And, you know, and as, as time would go on, I would realize, oh, when you say Hispanic, you think low socioeconomic advancement, low educational advancement, poor. Um, and to be fair, I came from a working class family, but in my experience, seeing the full breadth of the Dominican, Latino, Latin American experience um, gave me a sense of the good, the bad, and the ugly of it all. And here, it was very clear to me that when people saw me, um, when they referred to me, um, as simple as when I was um, in high school, getting accepted to all of the universities I was getting accepted, receiving comments like, oh, you got in because of affirmative action. Um, and, you know, and, and, and to be fair, me knowing so little that I didn't even know what affirmative action was at that point. The only sort of smart teenage response I could come up with is, no, I'm getting in because I'm smarter than you, <laughs> because I get better <laughs> grades than you, <laughs> which was all true. Um, but, but, it was, but it was those, those, those slights and those, those comments that um, felt very diminishing. It was um, getting accepted into one of, the, one of the colleges that I did and getting a letter 
inviting me to go to a summer program. Um, and the summer program was a math and English remedial program. And I had, I was just about to graduate with an English AP course under my belt. And so I couldn't understand why they thought that I needed to learn better English. I spoke English quite well. And I remember my aunt um, who like all Latina tias, you know, veers over your shoulder when she's reading what, you, <laughs> what you're doing. Um, and so she of course read what, what I was, uh, what I had received and said, oh, well, they think you're poor because you're Hispanic and they think you're uneducated because you're poor and Hispanic. Um, and needless to say, I did not attend that institution. I did not attend that program, but it was a time when I should have felt excited. I should have felt wanted and a, a sense of belonging. And what I felt was a sense of rejection and a minimization of who I was and who my people were. Um, and so those, those experiences carried with me in university. Um, and then I you know, went to Bucknell University. I got my undergraduate degree in international relations and women's studies. I caught the social justice bug, um, again, as one of the few students of color at Bucknell University. Um, my father used to joke. He's like, I send you to the whitest school in America and you come back a revolutionary. How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's exactly why it happens. <laughs> Because I have, I have, I have become farther aware of my otherness, <laughs> and 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 what it means also for me. In university was the time when I began understanding it within the U.S. context, um, and began understanding actually about my own origins. I mean, it was in it was at Bucknell where I learned about Haitian heritage and history, and I grew up in an island that is shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic. But because of historic legacies, very much rooted in racism, I had not learned about not just the atrocities of what the Dominican government and leaders had done to uh, the Haitian people, but I just didn't know about our history. And so for me, university was the time where I could learn and grow and really ensconce myself in race and class and gender. And so after, uh, after undergrad, I decided that I wanted to get a master's in public administration. Um, and I had participated in a program that had been created for uh, minority students the year before my senior year, by, led by Dr. Walter Stafford, who eventually became a dear mentor and friend. Um, and you know, his goal was to try and create more public policy master's programs for students of color. Um, and so I went and did that right after undergrad, and I thought I was going to stay in academia um, and realized that I could not live inside my head, <laughs> that, I loved, that I loved people and uh, engaging. And, and so right after my, um, my graduate degree, I uh, uh, was accepted into a fellowship for the Coral Fellows Program, which is a um, postgraduate leadership training program, and it was amazing. And over the course of nine months, I had nine different internships and um, learned about differences across sectors and how power gets shared and taken away um, and uh, how to navigate those environments. And for some reason, among the many, many learnings of my core experience, one of the realizations for me was that I had been in the nonprofit space for so long and I didn't know how to navigate the corporate space, that space that to me was the space that needed the most change systemically and operationally. And so my curiosity has always driven me uh, to do wild things. And so I decided to apply to, to all of these corporate jobs, um, initially most of them in finance. And um, not surprisingly, most of them rejected me <laughs> because I, um, while I had a good academic degree up to that point, I had never really taken finance and economics courses. I had shied away from them. Um, but I was really fortunate that Nicole Johnson at Moody Investor Service gave me a chance as a credit, rating, credit ratings analyst. And I ended up having a 12-year career at Moody's. I was a credit ratings analyst for six years in both domestic and international when we were opening up Latin American markets, it was really great to have the one Latina that spoke Spanish fluently. Um, I then uh, went and went on to manage our philanthropic programs globally, which was an amazing treat and something that I also thought, okay, here I found my lane, here's what I'm gonna do. And then I received the call one day to uh, be the company's first diversity and inclusion officer. And this was at a time when we didn't really talk about diversity and inclusion much. Um, and frankly, I had, 
never thought of HR as a role that I was interested in. When you are on the business side, HR is the place that you dread going to, is where bad <laughs> things happen. <laughs> um, and, um, and so it was the first time that I said no to what looked like a promotion, but I wasn't quite sure what it would be. Um, and it was also the first time that I learned about sponsorship. Uh, it was the company CFO, a woman who had put my name in the hat. And when she found out that I was sort of, you know, I, I, I didn't reject it, but that I was sort of questioning, um, you know, something that she had you know, decided, um, she came to my office and, and pretty much said, you don't say no to something I put your name on the hat for. Um, and I remember looking at her and going, do you even know who I am? <laughs> I was like, we've never had a conversation. <laughs> I've only presented in rooms where you've been. Um, and she, she paused and said, I've, I've been watching you. I think you can do this. Um, also, later on, I realized that they were they, they were also keen on finding someone that if things really messed up, it wouldn't be <laughs> huge to do for the organization. So I was relatively positioned that um, it was a, a, a well-calculated risk for them, um, but it was a life-transforming opportunity for me. And this is when I truly found my calling, and I launched the uh, Global Diversity and Inclusion Function for Moody's and led it for three years. And then from Moody's, I went on to Time Warner. Um, I did a lateral move uh, into their executive search function, focusing on diversity and inclusion, and did that um, for about two years. And then I got an amazing opportunity to go to Disney to not only lead uh, the diversity and inclusion function for the Disney ABC television group, uh, but also eventually to lead their talent acquisition function, which has become part of my trajectory. Um, and then I got the call to join Google and at Google, they created a role for me as the global uh, head of diversity staffing. Um, and there was always, um, it was also not just um, the head of global diversity staffing, but eventually went on to do more consulting work for the Alphabet companies. And then when we were really finally done with our California adventure, we were in LA for three years for Disney and then in San Francisco for two, um, I really desperately missed my family. And, and you're on the West Coast and you're Caribbean, it makes it really hard to go home. Um, mm. We came back to New York to be closer to my family and I joined Viacom to relaunch their talent acquisition function. Uh, always with my, my focus has always been on diversity and inclusion. And a year into that, as we restructured the organization, I had the rare opportunity to take advantage of having a year left on my contract and decided that I really, really needed a break. Um, so I took a year off. Um, and it's an amazing privilege that I have earned. And that was very hard to explain to my working class parents, especially my <laughs> abuela, my grandmother, who just kept on going like, wait, you don't go into the office every day and you are still putting food on the table um, and took a year off uh, and really uh, decompressed, traveled with my family um, and reconnected with myself um, and, and that immigrant sense of worth and value that I had been pushing myself for so long I had really caught up to me um, and I needed that and um, I, about a year into that uh, I, I was doing some volunteering work because I can you know, I'm Latina, I can't just sort of sit around. Um, and um, one of the organizations that I had the privilege of supporting was the Hollywood Commission to Eliminate Sexual Harassment and Advance Equality in the Workplace, mouthful. Um, and Dr. Anita Hill, um, the amazing uh, Dr. Anita Hill uh, leads it. And as I was updating Anita one day about some of the projects we were working on, um, I was telling her that I was not quite sure about what to do next and that I wasn't ready to go in-house yet, um, that the offers that I was receiving were a bit of the same old that I had seen over and over again. And she challenged me to go out on my own and to try, you know, to go places where I could, to create and implement my own ideas, to finally have that space to do so. And Melinda, you and I have talked about what that means because you, you've done that as well. Um, and so I did, and they were my first client. And I didn't look back. I mean, it was an amazing year. This was a, over a year ago. Um, and, and I was able to design my consultancy to focus on Fortune 500s, which is really has, that's been my lane for so long, but also nonprofits. I serve on several boards and we can talk about that later. And also startups because I'd had, I caught the bug being in, you know, in Silicon Valley and had started working with a few of them and, and investing and supporting a few. And so I, that's, that's been my career this past year. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. 
It's awesome. It's great to hear your experience. And in that, uh, there's so many things. I mean, you you touched on allyship and the and the people that were allies and supported you and sponsored you along that path. And I had the same experiences along the, my journey. There's no way I would be where I am today without those sponsors, without those people that believed in me, even when I didn't necessarily believe in myself and kind yeah. of shook me and said, no, you have to do this. Do they have to make this change? This is what you need to do right now. Yes. And it's made all the difference. That's great. Um, so th this is about the Latinx experience and you mm -hmm. shared your, your own experience. What, what is the Latinx experience? What does that mean? <laughs> what does that look like? You know, it's, it's funny. And you and I talked about it uh, as, as we were discussing this session, there isn't one experience and, you know, and, and that's what I, when I, when I talk to folks about, um, amplifying the Latinx experience, something that I feel really deeply passionate about. I'm also really clear on recognizing that I, I don't speak for the entire community of amazing Latin Americans and, you know, and U.S. Latinos. Um, but, I, but I usually start, as I mentioned to you, with a, with a little bit of a, you know, sort of a, a, a language class because we use a lot of terms, right? Because we're so complex. Um, and so I use the terms interchangeably and I choose to do that. Hispanic, Latina, Latinx. So here's, you know, here's, here's where they come from. Hispanic is the official term that was began uh, to be used in the 1970s by the U.S. government for anyone from Latin American or Spanish descent. Now, Latino includes people only from Latin America, including Brazil, but not Spain, <laughs> our colonizers, if you will. Um, and Latinx <laughs> is basically a gender neutral term that refers to people with heritage that ties to Latin America. And I use all of them because I believe that I am part of all of them. And, and I believe that, that the, 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 the pieces that speak to different folks are generational, are situational, um, but, but also speak to the complexity of, of our community. And so I, you know, I, I, I often say that you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace is one of the most important business issues of our time. But we can't talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion and not address the persistent barriers that affect Latinx employees in the workplace. And in order to do that, you have to begin with understanding where they come from, why they use the terms that they use, and what terms they prefer for, to you, for you to use. Mm -hmm. So I often tell leaders, don't, get, don't stumble into what terms, just ask, and then use that term. You're not going to go wrong, <laughs> quite frankly. And yes, yeah, some people may get offended or not, um, but, you know, but that creates a space for dialogue and for understanding a community and a group of folks that, um, for whom identity has been very layered for, all, for a very long time and continues to, to be that. Capturing the full breadth of being Latinx in America incorporates notions of ethnicity, of race, of culture, of language, of emotive attachments and affiliations, among other things. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, thank you for that. I, I think that's really important and something that a lot, a lot of people don't, um, don't, you know, use that language interchangeably. And I think that that key to all of this is and to being a better ally for anyone who's under anybody is to to ask to know to, to allow people to define themselves. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. A, there's, a, there's an agency in that. Um, you know, I didn't really use the word Latinx until I went to Google. Um, and it was really in, you know, in tech and Silicon Valley and, and the younger generation of millennials. Um, and, you know, and I, I was like, if that's if that's what makes you feel comfortable, I'm I'm down with that. I'm good. Um, you know, I'm not gonna belabor what these terms are because there there is nothing negative to any of them. It's simply a, a you know a, a form of of comfort. But if you don't come from that community, I think it creates a really great opportunity to better understand where people are coming from. And and people and and let me tell you, folks are usually really excited to talk about it. So. How do you amplify? What is the best? What are some of the ways to to amp, to amplify Latinx people in particular in the workplace and our in our lives overall? Yeah, I think the the first place to begin is with data, right? Is to let you know to emphasize and and lift up for folks some some of the data that may may, may feel like it's sort of hidden, but it's actually right in in your face. Like Hispanics represent America's fastest and largest growing consumer segment, and over seventy four percent of workforce growth. And yet we only represent 2.1% of board members across Fortune 1000 and publicly traded companies. 
despite being one of the fastest gro uh, growing groups of women in the US labor force, Latinas and Latinx females represent less than 1% of executives. And when it comes to the gender wage gap, and I know you know this, Melinda, Latinas are the bottom rung being paid 53 cents on the dollar relative to men. I like to level set with data. I like to share that. And it's not a woe is us piece, but it's really, it's, it's information. I, I like to remind folks that we trace our roots to Spain, to Mexico, to Spanish speaking nations of Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. And some of us are immigrants, that have been in this country since you know since we were children. Some of us are immigrants like I that came that came that came back here because I have I had an opposite migratory experience as teenagers. Um, some come here as full fledged adults um, and you know to join the companies that we work in. We are in many different stages of that that immigrant roadmap, if you will, and that all shapes who we are and you know and how we see ourselves in the American construct. And all of that shapes also the needs and, and, the, and the experiences of this really you know, broad community in the workplace. And so part of amplifying it is, is to understand the data, is to dig deeper into the fact that this is not a homogeneous grouping of folks um, and that their needs, wants, um, support structures are all very different. Um, and then it's about thinking, thinking about what, what isn't being said about this community. What, what are the particular challenges that exist for Latinos in the workplace? And so, for example, um, you know, access to important social networks is really critical to succeeding in organizations. But when people are worried about even what term to call you or, you know, or how to approach you, it's going to be really hard for you to have access to the social circles that are critical to career progression and success. And so that's also one of the reasons why I like to say, like, let's demystify this community and let's build closer proximity because that is the proximity that has been necessary for everyone since the beginning of time to advance in their careers. Um, the other piece that we know about, and this is mostly about minority groups, but it's, it's about how information gets shared. Um, you know, in most companies that I've worked for, every Latino that I, that I, that I speak to for the most part, um, you know, there's these lags and who has, who gets access to information. <laughs> I was like, what do you know? Uh, and, and by information, I mean, do you understand the code of conduct for the organization? And, and, and not just the, you know, what's on paper um, for, you know, behaving well or not, but what is, you know, what, what is the right way to, you know, now, what is the right way to approach a Zoom meeting? What is the right, right way to approach your manager for a conversation? If you don't come from a culture and a community like I did, that, where you know how to navigate corporate culture right away, if you don't have folks to help you decode that in an organization, then you're going to fall behind far, much faster than others who really, what they, have, what they have ahead of you is just facility in how to navigate an, an environment um, and how to collaborate, how to access innovative ideas and tools, how to um, be aware of what career opportunities, how do you reduce those barriers? And you do that by, again, having a better understanding of this community. I can go on and on, but I'll stop there. Yeah, I think one more thing that you have mentioned to me before is the story is storytelling is really mm -hmm. ma uh, creating spaces for people to tell their own stories and mm -hmm. and amplifying the stories, I think, as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I will say this and I, I say very little is um, is generic to the entire uh, Latin, uh, Latin American diaspora, but storytelling is so it's, it's such a critical piece of the way that culture gets passed on um, across, across the world. And so for, for, for me, I think that when, when I think of storytelling in the, in the workplace, it's such a critical piece of shedding light on what people don't know and, and challenging dominant views about what leadership could look like and what relationships could look like or even what difference feels like. Sometimes when we, when we share stories, we, we find commonalities with each other that we didn't know existed because we are just, you know, operating from the, gen, you know, the general stereotypes that we've been taught to think about. But in storytelling, sometimes we, 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 we build that proximity. We see each other through each other. And, and, and we also tell the stories um, and find connection points that wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, and so I think storytelling is a critical piece. And, and, and let's be clear, 
different voices get different power in organizations. Different voices are heard differently. And so I, mm-hmm. I as I have moved um, in my career, have realized that in the early part of my career, perhaps my voice didn't have as much weight, but it has more now as a, and it has had as a senior executive. And so I'm very mindful of um, the fact that I have more freedom and opportunity to share, shed light and share stories that other folks may not have. And so it may not be my experience right now, as a, let's say as a senior executive, that, um, that I'm worried about speaking up in a meeting, but I have been there. And so my job is to make sure that when we're in meetings, I emphasize that, that I create a space for those who may be feeling uncomfortable, who may be feeling disconnected, um, and, that I, and that I explain why. And, and that's where the storytelling piece comes in. And so I share a story when I worked at Moody's and you know, in the early part of my career where I had an ally, a dear, uh, a dear friend, you know, pulled me aside one day and he was sort of peeved, which he usually wasn't. And he, he literally said, he's like, you know, we don't pay you to be silent. We pay you for your opinion. I mean, here I am in a company that was supposed to be helping me hone my voice because everyone in a rating committee had equal vote. But here I am also being held back by my own sense of being the only woman, the only person of color, usually the youngest person in these meetings, the differential the difference in power um, that I was very keen on, and also, you know, the stereotype threat that many of us feel. If I mess up, then I mess up for everyone behind me. And so, you know, and that's, whoa, it's so much pressure. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's, like, it's, you know it just, it, it, it locks us in so often, and it was locking me in. And I needed that ally, who was a white male, I needed that ally to call that out, but I also needed something that was incredibly special in that moment. I needed him to listen to me. And he did. He didn't just say, oh, you're being crazy. <laughs> you know, he didn't mansplain it. He didn't culture explain it. <laughs> you know he, he listened. And, and, I, ha- and I, I also engaged in a vulnerable exchange with him. I said, well, here's why I'm not talking. I'm just, I'm scared. And, and I don't remember the exact words, but I really, I listened to the effect of I'm scared, I'm nervous. I'm worried. And, you know, and he said, okay. And I think if I may have tapped into something from when he remembered when he was younger, I, I don't know what happened in that moment, but he heard me. And instead of explaining me away, he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. At the next meeting, I need you to talk. <laughs> I need you to say <laughs> something. And when you're worried, look at me and I'm going to be there behind you. And if you want, mm. I can prompt you. And I said, no, no, I don't, don't prompt me. That's going to stress me out. I was like, but I, I promise you I'll talk. And what happened was that we not only built a really great relationship, was that I not only started talking one sentence, two sentences, then you couldn't shut me up after that. But you know, that's how I found my confidence. I'm, I'm often told that I have a lot of confidence and that, you know, how did I gain it? And I was like, you know, it was, it's just like my smile. It was hard earned. It's not something that I just, you know, that came about. It, it, it happened over time, but I do have to say that I, for me, it was really critical in those early stages of my career to have someone who heard me, who saw me, and who was willing to be there for me. And I have other examples of, of folks like that that were not, <laughs> frankly, that were not Latinos because I didn't have any other Latinos around me, um, but, that, but, that helped, um, but that helped me find and hone my voice. Um, and that helped create that space for me to, in a space where there wasn't a lot of like for me, where I could, I, I could create my own space in my language. And, that's, and, and that was really critical. So I share those stories to remind folks that I was like, that, I'm not alone in that. There are so many of us that experience that, so many of us in, in my generation, but so many young Latinx you know, employees now who are experiencing the exact same thing. Because guess what? Organizations have not changed. <laughs> we have been at this for a really long time, but we have the exact same systemic pressures. This is the same systemic discrimination, same systemic failures that still, quite frankly, maintain workplaces that are predominantly white and predominantly male. And while that continues, and while it continues to go on question, people that look different, and, it's, and it, could, it could be Latinx, it could be Black, Asian, I mean, you name it, anything that's outside of the norm will always have a, a, hard find, a hard time finding their way through unless someone truly sees and values them. And you have worked at several different companies on diversity, inclusion, belonging, culture. How 
do you create a culture where people feel like and maybe even know how to be allies for each other in that way that you know how do you how do you create that culture that really opens up space for people to step in and be allies and help others become leaders uh, you know it's, it's certainly not easy and i have a lot of colleagues who are in the same space as uh, as, as you and i uh, yeah it's, it's not magic i mean this is I, I often talk about this as some of the hardest work you'll ever do um, and you know, and culture is what naturally happens when whenever you bring a group of human beings together and have them work or live together for for some time. And it happens whether whether you know it's happening or not. Um, and I think that part of doing this work well is about being intentional. It's about being willing to ask the questions that we're not often primed to ask, um, but that are really uh, you know underneath. And 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 here's the thing about culture and organizations. You. You have your senior leaders at the top and you have your junior folks at the bottom and your senior leaders are often operating with blind spots about what's happening in an organization your more junior folks the folks on the ground are the ones that are heavily burdened by the sore spots by the pains of what that power differential looks like and so the if you don't reduce that gap between what the leadership things they know and what the folks on the ground are experiencing, you don't get to change. And that, and that's, that's where, that's where culture change truly happens is when you, when you reduce, when you reduce that distance between what you think, you know, and what the actual experience of your employees is. Um, and, and that, that comes from, you know, uncovering truth that comes from asking really tough questions and it's hard, it's complex, it's triggering. Um, it fundamentally requires you to recognize your personal blind spots and your organization's cultural and systemic sore spots. And that's, you know, and, and, and those operate amongst themselves, but they also operate in different corners of the organization, if you will, right? So you, you're also gonna have to control to confront um, your deep-seated beliefs and unconscious habits. And we've been talking about unconscious bias for it seems well over a decade now. Um, but but you know, knowing that they exist and confronting them are two separate things. And and really digging into the why I operate the way I do, and then being willing to take action that changes the way you've been operating, that's that's the real crux of it. You know, you're it's it's about exploring your identity in relationship to others and asking for feedback you may not want to hear. Um, it's about building these new muscles, right? And, and that includes the capacity to interpret new information, but also to sit in ambiguity, to sit in conflict, mm -hmm. to sit in discomfort, and then to determine what's possible when you witness a workplace inequity, when you witness something that doesn't feel right. But you have to do all of that work in order to be able to take the action. And I think we get stuck in the awareness piece of like, uh, surface awareness like i know inequities mm -hmm. happen i know i have unconscious biases but we don't do the deep deep work mm -hmm. what do you personally need from an ally right now what do you need from allies right now as a latina as a woman as a as daisy <laughs> yes um i think it's what we all need right we all have a fundamental human need to be seen and to feel valued, and and you know my my allies, and I have I have many allies, um, are the ones that see me, are the ones that see me for the good, the bad, and the ugly, <laughs> are the ones that can call me out when you know when I'm hiding and when I'm going into you know sort of you know whatever whatever dark moment you know I want to go into, um, but they're also the ones that um, that truly see me, and it's not it's not about. Um, you know, I say this to my daughter a lot. My daughter's 11 and, you know, and sometimes I see myself making the same mistakes that I think every mother has ever. And certainly that my mother of me wanting her to behave in a certain way, because that's how I behave, because that's how I am. And so, you know, I'm projecting on her um, and in and, and moments of clarity, which are not, I would love to say they're often, but they're not, you know, I stop myself from doing that and say, I was like, no, she is her own person. And my job is to make sure that, you know, that she is clear from, you know, on values and on character and on, you know, on, on morals. Those, those, are, that's, that's what I'm, that's, that's what I'm aiming for here. But the other behavioral pieces, like she can, she can operate differently because she's her own person. And so to have an ally be able to help you find your way without projecting on you who you should be, especially, mm -hmm 
especially when that projection is about a white male <laughs> sense of identity that is, that, that is not only not who you are, but that diminishes who you are, that erases who you are. And so that the, the reason why I use the word amplifying about the Latinx experience is that it's, you know, we've been marginalized and silenced for so long, even in the diversity and inclusion conversation. And so what I often say, and I was the executive sponsor for the Latino ERG at, uh, at Google, you know, that, that was actually one of our goals, amplifying the Latinx voice at Google. Um, because, you know, I, I was, when I joined there, I realized I was like, no one's really talking about us. Like we get, you know, we get on a, a little list, but the resourcing is not the same. The engagement is not the same, but the storytelling is not the same. Folks are not, not trying to understand who we are. And so, so for me, it's an ally that's willing to understand who you are and then that uses their power because that's what an ally does, right? Use their power to help amplify your voice, to help amplify your story, to not wait always for you to be the one that has to you know, bear the burden of the work, but to actually be the one that you know, says, I was like, I've just learned something interesting. You know, I was like, I, or, or I would love to plus one what Daisy just said. Um, you know, that was interesting. And I don't, and, and even admitting, I was like, and I don't quite understand it. <laughs> I love for her to, you know, explain it a little bit more because it could probably be me, more me than you. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's showcasing and modeling that kind of behavior that signals to others that it's okay to do so that it signals to others that you see them and you value, value them. And it signals to others that those questions you may be having, it's like, it's perfectly okay to have them. And it's perfectly okay to voice them in the spirit of creating a more collaborative and engaged workforce. We have a question from Brianna Johnson. What would your advice be to a junior employee who is the only black woman in her entire workforce to get an ally? Oh my goodness, you've got an entire workforce to find allies, right? <laughs> so um, so I, I think, listen, part, part, part of finding allyship is, is about human connection as well. Um, and so I encourage you to find, first of all, find individuals in the organization that you admire, that you respect. Um, it doesn't hurt if they have power, <laughs> and if they have influence in the organization, that's, that's also a plus. Um, I'll share this story and I've shared this publicly. When I was at Google, I had a young um, uh, Latinx woman uh, from uh, the Latino ERG, and I think I had been in the company for a couple of months and she asked me for coffee and I always say yes. <laughs> I was like, why not? Um, and as we started chatting, um, we just had this amazing experience and it was, and she had been in tech for far longer than I. So I was learning so much about how to navigate Google. And I was talking to her about my experience. And I've written about this because um, afterwards she wrote a blog um, about us connecting. She, she wrote, um, uh, I think she wrote an, uh, an uh, uh, she wrote on her diary about it and then she, and then she shared it. Um, but in it, she said that the minute that the elevator doors closed on us, she started crying because it was the first time that she had seen herself reflected in a senior leader. And it was the first time that she had, that she had actually breathed and thought, I don't have to be like the models that I am seeing every day that I have been rejecting for some reason, I didn't have words for it. Now I know why, <laughs> because that's not who I want to be. But I, but I want to be this because this is who I am and I can. And I can actually succeed and I can actually achieve because I've seen it, right? If you can see it, you can be it. Um, and it was so incredibly powerful. And then she went on to talk about, you know, how I'm doing now. Like I talk with my hands, how back then I had really long hair and I just kept on flipping it. Like her, you know, like her tias and her mother um, that I wore a dress, which was very different from, you know, how most Googlers dress. But, you know, I'm just much more comfortable wearing my dress and my heels and, you know, and that, that, I, that I walked in being who I was and that that gave her a real sense of who she could be um, and how powerful that was and that that's been for, forever one of my most powerful stories but the other piece about that was that towards the end as I joked with her I was like you're burying the lead here because she was so nervous about asking me for one simple thing which was if I could be the executive sponsor for the Latino ERG and I paused and I told her, I was like, I've been waiting for you to find me. <laughs> I, I know that this ERG exists and no one's called me. So, so I say that also because sometimes you think that you're, you know, infringing on people's times, but like, but folks want to be helpful. 
folks want to be useful, um, especially if you have a diversity and inclusion strategy in your company, you're actually doing them a favor because now they get to say they're doing this. Um, mm -hmm. I coach executives all the time. And part of what I always ask them is, who are you mentoring? Who are you coaching? Who are you sponsoring? And they'll tell me, they're like, well, I don't know. And I was like, well, you've got people on your team. So I'm always encouraging them to, to find them. Um, but I have actually, I just had this uh, two weeks ago, I had a, a, a male executive at a very large uh, bank um, who all of a sudden paused and said, oh, wait a second. I had this young black woman who reached out to me the other day in our, in our Ask Me Anything sessions and asked me if I could have coffee with her. And this was pre-COVID. And so I've, I've had to push it away, but I just realized, Oh, I, you know, she reached out and I said, well, you know, we're zooming coffees now, right? <laughs> so you can get back to her and have that coffee with her. And he looked at me, he goes, I guess I can. And, you know, and so it was, it was this moment of realization for him, like, oh, like I, I have, I have agency over doing that. And there are people that I already have identified that I could be helpful to. So for those who are looking like, get in front of them, <laughs> let them know ask. you're here and you're eager. Like asking is, you know, it's like, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, there, you know, there's tons of expressions, of, you know, across the world that's, you know, let's say, if you don't ask, you don't get anything. Like just ask and, you know, and, and you don't have to ask for even 30 minutes. I know we're all zoomed out at this point and everybody's always stressed out. You know, I, you know, like 15 minutes in 15 minutes, you can make a quick introduction, get to know each other, kind of, you know, high energy, how are you, whatever. And I was like, and if there's interest, can I now get 30 minutes and two weeks on, on your time? Like you can build into that without it feeling so onerous. But I will tell you, most people love to talk about themselves. <laughs> so if, you create, if you create a space for them to talk, there's so much learning for you and there's relationship building and there's an opportunity for both of you to learn and grow. Awesome. Uh, Aubrey Williams asks <laughs> what and or who has helped you hone in on your power and truth. You talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, and where do you find inspiration? Um, so I talked about my, my, my early allies, but I've had a lot of allies throughout my life. And, um, and, you know, my, my grandmother would call them angels, right, that showed up at different parts of my life um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to remind me when you know when i'm when my voice is getting muted to remind me to lift it up a little bit um and i still need that um so you know my biggest inspiration quite frankly and i, I just realized that i was having a conversation with someone uh the other day is my family because they i am deeply loved i have always been deeply cared and ferociously so um and you know i joke with my grandmother because she literally just sent me a WhatsApp. By the way, my grandmother calls it WhatsApp, <laughs> but she just sent me a, <laughs> a, a WhatsApp um, where she was asking me about an award that I received and because she wants to show it off to somebody. Um, and I just, every once in a while when I'm having a really down moment, I think about like, how would my grandmother brag about me right now? <laughs> like, what would my grandmother say about me? Because that usually kind of like lifts me up. Um, you know, like a lot of people, I keep these, you know, gratitude email boxes where I, I keep everything that people have sent me and I, I go to them. And those are moments where like my heart just, you know, when my heart feels depleted, I, you know, I, it, it lifts me up. Um, having conversations like this are actually inspiring to me because it, it allows me to connect to people and, and to be of service. And I think that um, for many of us, service is self-care, it's giving to others. Um, but my you know, I have a lot of inspirations, but I'll say right now, because you can't hear her, but I'm listening to my daughter playing Minecraft with her friends behind me. Um, and she's, you know, she's my biggest inspiration. Um, you know, being, being a mother, um, being a mother for me, I'll, I'll, you know, in the spirit of, of transparent trust, you know, and transparent uh, storytelling, being a mother for me was, was something I really dreaded. Um, my mother had abandoned me as a child. And so I, I, you know, I didn't realize all of the baggage that I had about that. I had grown up with like, three amazing mothers. I had my grandmother and my two aunts that overmothered me. <laughs> you know, so I was like, I had a lot of love, but I did carry that for a long time. And I didn't know that I was gonna have a boy or a girl. We decided to wait. And when they told me that it was a girl, and it's like, you know, I, I was I was sort of terrified. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, like how am I gonna how am I gonna be a, a good mother? Um, and I think I'm a really great mother. I, I, I love my daughter. Um, but there's there's this there's this light that she emanates. There's this there's this love and there's this um, hope that I have for her to be able to walk anywhere on this earth and feel seen, feel valued, feel respected, feel safe. And so that's my inspiration because 
my daughter, and I don't know of any of you who are parents, like when you become a parent, you kind of like become a global parent. Like every child is your child. Um, and to me, it's just, I want every child to experience that. I want every little girl to be able to feel that sense of agency over her body and her future and every little boy as well. So that's, that's my inspiration. And when I, when I see when I see the organizations that I work with, when I see the employees that I work with, I think, I think of, of, of who they are and the families that they represent and the hope that they represent, and that's inspiration for me. Sujin asks about tokenization. Have you ever felt tokenized? And what do you do about it, essentially? Or how do you, how do you handle it in the moment? And her second question is, do you leave a company if you're feeling tokenized consistently? Oh, I have been the chief Latina in charge for a long time. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I mean, listen, we've 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 all been tokenized. Uh, as as amazing as um, that story I shared about being, uh, you know, being a, you know, being uh, identified as the future head of diversity for Moody's, I very much recognize that I was being tokenized into that role as a woman of color, a young woman of color, um, to do that. I was, you know, I, I, it is it is unfortunately part of the existence of being. A member of a marginalized community um, working in majority cultures and that is all I have ever worked in um, and so I, ha I have friends that um, I often like just sort of sit down and go what's it like you know to work in an all Latino organization <laughs> what's it like to work in an all black organization like, like talk to me like you know and by the way those are not perfect either because again they're just human beings um, but you know but but I think <laughs> in, in part uh, I have uh, to answer your question um, I have I have had to, like, like I've said earlier, I have found a way of voicing my uh, my sense of discomfort, um, the sense of lack of um, lack of uh, fairness in being tokenized over the course of my career. So what I say now is very different. Point. You know, I, I was actually very silent in the early part of my career. I just I did what my my father told me. I put my head down and I had and I did my work like that. You know, and, and by the way, my father still says that to me before any job that I take. <laughs> and I like to remind him, I was like, Papi, actually my job is to be loud <laughs> and to be changing. He's like, no, 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 Mina, just keep your head down and do your job. Like that's, you'll be okay if you do that. Um, but, but I have worked in organizations where um, as, I, as I've become wiser um, and frankly gained more equity and power in organizations, I've been able to challenge um, where I've been placed and what I've been placed to do. Um, I no longer accept being just the voice of diversity, and I, I know I have been in, in places. I no longer uh, I'm willing, and that you know that was part of the conversation with Dr. Hill when I decided to go out on my own. That um, I had some really great offers in front of me, um, but but I, I I kept on thinking I've seen that movie play out before. You want me to be the face of this work, but you you're, I'm not going to have the institutional power to actually change things. And so I'm, I'm no longer willing to do that. Um, but but, I've, but I've, I've been able to earn that place. And, it's, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate it. I want to recognize that it's harder when you're more junior and, and in more precarious situations where you, know, you, you can't just sort of get up in the middle of a meeting and say, hey, y'all, I'm feeling tokenized and you've got to change your ways um, because that will endanger you. Um, and and I, let me be very clear. Uh, I don't want to endanger anybody. I, I want to create spaces where you can succeed. Um, but I do think that there's, there's space, time, um, and opportunities to be able to speak and educate people about not just what the word tokenization means, but how it feels, um, how it impacts your well-being, how it impacts your psyche, and how it impacts your productivity. And, and I have seen white male and female leaders um, reckon with that and recognize that and, and challenge themselves to drive change. It's not easy again. It's a continual uh, amount of work. I, I sit on the board of Planned Parenthood. I'm the vice chair. Um, and I'll say this, and you know, I don't know if the chair will be listening to this. The chair is an amazing white woman. Um, but when she asked me to be her vice chair, um, I, I didn't really have much of a relationship with her at that point. And I looked at her and I said, I was like, I'm not gonna be your Latina wife, um, you know, just sort of sitting next to you in board meetings. Um, and, you know, and she paused and she was like, oh no, like, let, let me tell you what I'm about. And then she walked me into the changes she wanted to bring. The reason why she had selected me is because of the work I had done in inclusion, because of the voice that I had already established on the board. Um, and we are now going into, we actually just celebrated our one year um, chair and vice Chair uh, 
friend, whatever that is, anniversary yesterday, um, and we were talking about what an amazing relationship we built. Um, but she remembers that that was the first thing I said. I was like, you know, like I'm not going to be tokenized. I am not going to be, you know, that that you're, you know, sort of like your side piece, if you will, um, to uh, to to give you cred. And that was to her credit. That was not at all where she was going. But I'm, but but I felt confident enough, and um, and you know, and secure myself to say. That, that's that's not what I want. If you want to drive change, I'm here for that. And this is this is what you're going to get from me. Um, and she's and she knows that because you know that's the exact relationship that we had, and it has been an amazing relationship. Um, but but it is it, it's it, it's calling out the truths about tokenism is and it and it's knowing when the right time to do it is. And sometimes it's in piecemeal. So sometimes it's just calling something in a meeting like, wasn't this interesting? And then something I was like, do you like, did, you know, did you hear that? Um, and, you know, and I do really believe in the power of calling in versus calling out. By the way, I think calling out is a perfectly good tactic. <laughs> it's like it works in many ways. Um, but I do, but I also do believe, I'll, I'll share another example. I, um, I have a, 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 call, a fr I'm in, I'm in a, a many groups of women's circles, if you will, and networks. And um, a, a member of that network was launching a Connect for initiative for women. I actually, I, I, she talked about this. And so she had um, challenged all of us to try and connect for women for this, the, every day for a week. And we got this invitation and I wrote back to her and I said, how do you make sure that you're connecting across difference? Um, and she was like, oh, I, I just assumed it would happen. And, and so then we, that, that came into an, ex, went into an exchange and I was like, well, you know, I love that you're inviting me, but I was like, am I the only Latina on that list? And, you know, I, I, the other white women on that list going to also be challenged to try and find other women of color and women across difference and also do it in a way that is not about tokenizing, but about building real relationship and access and opportunity and paving the way for the women of color that, have that, a, a path that has not been paid for them before. And that turned into an amazing conversation and we worked at it. And, and she actually said that in a session that we had. She said, I want to call. And, and then she said, thank you for calling me out. And I said, no, no, let me be clear. I called you in. Because calling you out was for me to have emailed the entire group <laughs> and to have said, here's why I'm not joining. And here's, here's what I think is wrong. I was like, I emailed you privately. I had the conversation with you and then you, and I helped you change the, the description and we went through it. So, and so she's used that afterwards. And it was a moment where I was able to talk about tokenism in a way that, um, that she could understand and that would hopefully change the way that she operates going forward. And others. Awesome. It, it, there's so many more great questions and we unfortunately we can't get to them all. So Starlet, Deborah, Linda, Carolina, Darnell, sorry, we didn't get to your questions. So we'll try to address those in the future. Daisy, uh, quickly, is there anything you would like to amplify right now? Oh my goodness, there's so much. Um, you know, every day it changes. Uh, to, today I will talk about my, one of the causes that is near and dear to my heart, which is Planned Parenthood. Um, and, um, you, you know, it, it, in, in these days and times where we know that uh, marginalized communities are being further marginalized, um, where so many of the benefits that some of us take for granted are being taken away from so many of us. Uh, I'm seeing the huge, um, the, the huge impact that this um, pandemic is having on states and counties and, um, and communities where um, it's, it's about healthcare. It's about agency over your body. It's about choice. And women and women of color are disproportionately being impacted by the changes in policies across the country. So if any of you can support a Planned Parenthood affiliate center near you, um, if any of you can you know, talk, write to your congressman, if any of you can support this good work, um, it is our health, it is, it is, um, it is our economies, it is, how, it is how women can survive and thrive. Um, and so that's, uh, that, has, that has a special place for me today. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you so much for all of this. Thank this is you, amazing. Melinda. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So keep this going. We've been talking for an hour about this and so much good stuff here. Keep the conversations going. Keep the learning going. Be brave. Be, brave, be courageous. Take action. Take action. Thank you for joining us. Join us each week for Leading with Empathy and Allyship. You can sign up to attend with live audience QA or catch the podcast or the video. And you can stay in the loop by going to changecatalyst.co, changecatalyst.co, and signing up for our newsletter. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel. All right. See you next time, everybody. Thank you.